and turn to the book of uh, Psalm chapter number 50. We started on that chapter last week. We didn't finish it. And uh, so we'll try to get down to uh, finishing that on this evening. Ma- uh, I'll keep wanting to call it, say Matthew for some reason or other. I'm not, and I haven't even been par- preparing a message out of Matthew, so something's wrong. But uh, Psalm chapter 50, a psalm of, of the man uh, Asaph, and uh, we uh, talked, uh, shared with you last week some very important principles concerning uh, his life and what he was facing. This week, what are we really giving or doing for God? I think we need to ask ourselves that often. Uh, Because God does so much for us. Would you say amen to that? God does so much for us. But not only that, does he do a lot of things for us, but he gives us a lot of things, doesn't he? He's the best giver I've ever found in my life. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What are we really giving and doing for God? And how often we take for granted what God has permitted us to have in our lives. So many different things. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about that. For example, the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 28. If you make a note, you can write that scripture down. But in Acts 17 28, it says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. And of course, we're that because of the fact that we've been born into the family of God. We're children of God, and God delights in giving things. How many of you like to give to your children, your grandkids? Yes. I love to do that. And I love to give to other people when I have it. Uh, because it's a joy, and uh, the Lord always, I'm not, and this is not my motive, but I'm glad I'm a recipient of it. But the Bible says, given it shall be given you. And so uh, it's just a joy to give. And I, I just like to see people's uh, face light up uh, when you give them something, uh, whether it be a material things or whether it be financial or what. Yes? About people giving back to you. About people giving back to you? Well, I don't take things back. <laughs> Because you're still, a, you're still a blessing from us at that time. I had a man years ago, and I'll have to give you this. I had a man in uh, my church uh, years ago uh, that I pastored, and he, couldn't, he didn't have enough money hard to put food on his table. And one day, I, I think I was going to a conference or something. I can't remember exactly, but I was, I was going to make a trip. I don't know if it was I was going on vacation or if I was going to a conference. I believe it was a conference. This man walks up. And he sticks in my hand some money. And I said, you don't have to give me that. I says, you can't afford that. He says, preacher, don't steal the blessing from me. And so I just stuck it in my pocket. I didn't even look at what it was. I got home. And of course, I tried to empty my pockets and so forth. And uh, a $10 bill. That man couldn't afford it. He didn't have the money to give. I mean, that was... Uh, that was like, you know, uh, a week's wages for him. And so uh, it's always a joy to take and be able to, uh, uh, when, if somebody gives something to you, you take it. But in certain cases, that when I give, don't you try to give it back to me because I want you to keep it because you steal the blessing from me, all right? Okay. But anyway, we talk about the matter of uh, what are you really giving and doing for God. Do you know what God would, what would rather receive from you than anything else? Praise. Yourself. Present yourself. Uh, Paul said something about that there in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Have you ever found God unreasonable? No, not at all. So he wants us to do that. And Paul talked about that along that line. God has given us not only life, but he's given us instruction in regards to what we're doing in our life. I'm glad when we can get right instruction. I'm glad when it, it, it's for our benefit. And God does that. And he's given us, that's why he gave us the Bible, to give us instruction on how to live, how to be successful. 
And we could go into a lot more of that uh, in regards to the things that God does for us. But we have a great good giving God, and we need to give back to Him. Uh, I think about this in 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 19 through 20. He says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So we think we own things, and we really don't own things at all. Here's the point. God gives us or loans us what we have, that we use it for his good, and for our, I mean, for his glory and for our good. And when we think about that, that changes the whole outlook on things that we have. My, my, you know, I don't, myself, I don't own myself. Uh, by the way, if people would realize, you know, that their bodies are not their own, we wouldn't have all the abortions in the world, would we? We wouldn't have it. Why? Because if they realize their body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the body is the temple that God gave them, whether they're a Christian or not, it still belongs to the Lord. That body was given to them. And so if we realize that, uh, we wouldn't have a problem in regards to all the things, or evil things, and, and all the things that are going on in regards to abortion and, and stealing and all the other things. Wasn't that fantastic about those three young ladies being rescued? I think we'll say glory to God, amen, all right? I mean, to see some young ladies like that uh, delivered from uh, the evil things that are going on in the world, and boy, what a blessing that was. And I, I just kept watching that because of the fact of thinking about uh, how their release and their freedom after so many years must have been such a relief not only to themselves, but to their families. Well, think about the fact of being released from your sins, Huh? You've been in bondage all those years, and you get saved. Folks, that's something to shout about. That's something to be uh, happy about. And we are happy when people get delivered uh, from such a, an abduction like that and so forth. But uh, we praise the Lord for the fact of that. Anyway, let's get back to the end of our study tonight. What are we really giving and doing for God? Look down and let's begin at verse number 8. It says, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have uh, been continually before me. Now, here's what was happening. Asaph, maybe some of the other people of Israel were offering sacrifices to the Lord. And the people were doing it on a consistent, persistent uh, basis. But you know what they were doing it for? They were doing it with the wrong attitude and motive. They weren't doing it from their hearts. They were doing it because they felt, well, you know, if I do this for God, maybe he'll do this for me. Uh, they were brought continually. You think of Solomon there in the book of uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 21. It says, And they sacrifice sacrifices unto the Lord and offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. On the next day, even a thousand bullocks. Now watch this. They offered a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs with a drink offerings and sacrifice in abundance for all Israel. Now, if I count right there, uh, uh, that's 3,000 offerings at one given time that the people were given. You know what the problem was? Some of them didn't give with the right attitude and the right motives. And that's what happens a lot of times. We get, uh, we, we violate God's word or we, you know, we give it uh, out of a wrong attitude. I was thinking as I was preparing uh, this lesson this week, uh, looking back at King Saul. If you were to go back there to 1 uh, Samuel chapter 15, you'll find out that God had to deal with uh, King Saul because he disobeyed God in regards to dealing with the Amalekites. God said, go in and destroy everything. You remember the story? And so Saul goes in with the people and, and, and uh, uh, they disobey God. They take of the best sheep and the animals and so forth. And they even kept King Agag alive when God said, destroy them all. And so God says, all right, Samuel, Saul 
is offering all kinds of sacrifices to me, but he has not obeyed my word. Besides that, I'm going to tell him right down the line that he has committed rebellion, which is like the sin of witchcraft. So Samuel comes and he, 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 he begins to talk to uh, uh, King Saul. And the Bible says there, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. Right. He hadn't obeyed the voice of the Lord. He had disobeyed the voice of the Lord. And have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek. Boy, he showed his colors right there right off the bat because God told him to put him to death. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and ox, and the chief of the things, which had been utterly destroyed. And here's the statement. The sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel lowers a boom. Samuel says, wait a minute. Stop right there, King Saul. Something is wrong here. Didn't you understand what God said? What, what words didn't you understand that God gave you in regards when he says, put all of them to death? What, 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 did, what little portion didn't you understand about the matter of putting to death those things that God told you to do? And he says, utterly destroy everything. And King Saul says, wait a minute. I did it to the Lord. You see, folks, we can do things to the Lord, but if God's already said something in his word, and we disobey the word, guess what? Rebellion, wrong attitude. See? It's like sometimes when people come to my office and, and uh, I counsel them about uh, marrying a certain individual and I say, wait a minute, number one, that person's not a Christian. And you claim to be a Christian. And the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But I love them. Hello? Doesn't matter. If the person's not saved, you're not to be unequally, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I've had other people, well, I, I, just, I just want to do this. Well, you just want to do what God told you not to do, see. And we're doing the same thing. We're offering God all kinds of, it, it, it's like this. person comes, tips God with a, you know, a dollar bill, and he, he, he thinks he, he's done what God wants him to do. All right, uh, God says you ought to do this or do that. And uh, they completely, you know, they try to pacify God by some of the things that they do. And uh, folks, to obey, the Bible says, is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. You see, Saul had heard the word of the Lord, but he thought that he was a little bit better uh, in his wisdom than what God was. He thought he had a better idea than what God had. I want to tell you something, folks. We better start listening to what God has to say. That includes preachers. That includes people in the pew. That includes all of us. See, all of us need to take and to be very, very careful about what we do. Sacrifice is a way, they think, of buying God's favor. And when that attitude prevails, then we've got a problem. See, that's not what God wants us to do. Uh, in other words, uh, here's the scenario. God, look at what I've done and am doing for you. And because I've done this, you owe me this. After all, it's equal return. Wrong attitude. See? Now, we ought to understand God does bless us when we do it out of the right attitude and out of the right motives. Matter of fact, God, God just, what should I say, is energized by us being obedient unto him. Uh, doesn't he say... Give Now, I'm not just talking about money here. I, I, I'm not on the money subject tonight. I'm talking about our lives. I'm about talking about different things that women give, our time, our talents, whatever it might be. Giving it shall be given you, pressed down, shaken together, running over what God put in your bosom when you do something like that. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You cannot give God in anything you do. See? And... Here, Asaph's writing, he's saying, look, he says the problem with what's happening here is we think that we're giving God back, we're tipping God, we're giving God back something on a continued basis, but our heart's not really in it. We're giving for the, with the wrong attitude. And we've got to be careful about that. 
And uh, God deals with us. Uh, years ago, a woman told uh, uh, another a brother, a Christian, by the name of Tim Keller. Uh, this lady had heard the gospel, and here's what she said. I know why I want my morality to save me. If I'm saved by my good works, then, like a taxpayer, I have rights. I've paid into the system, and God owes me a good and decent life. And there's a limit to what the Father can ask of me. But if I'm saved by sheer grace, then my life belongs entirely to the Father. He owes me nothing, and there's no limit to what He can ask of me. Well, folks, that is not the right attitude. That's going completely against Scripture. But that's the philosophy a lot of people today. That's, hey, listen. It's like those who claim to be atheists. I don't believe in God. Well, you know why they don't believe in God? Because if they don't believe in God, they're not accountable to Him. But they really are accountable to Him whether they believe it or not, see. All of us are. But that's the philosophy that a lot of people have. If I just don't believe in it, if I don't go to church, then I'm not accountable to God. See? Wrong. See? Revelation chapter 20 talks about the great white throne judgment, and I talked about that last week. God is going to be... Matter of fact, if you just jump back a little bit there, look down at verse number 6. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. And they use the word law. He says, now stop and think about that. God is the judge. And so he looks, and I, by the way, I'm glad that God is the judge, aren't you? Now, because if you look at me and you judge me, uh, uh, you don't see my, the intents of my heart, do you? See? You don't see the depths of my heart. And by the way, that's the reason we should never judge anybody wrongly because we don't know what has happened to their lives. We don't know what's going on that day that's transpiring in their lives. Let God be the judge. See, I, I might say, well, so-and-so wasn't in church. That's between them and God. That's not my responsibility because you know why? They may be at home because they may be very sick. Or we don't know the heartache that they're going through at that particular time. Or what they've, that they've been faced with. And what they're dealing with. So we're not, to, we're not to judge a person along that line. And sometimes we do as human beings. We've got to let God be the judge. And he looks at the intents of the heart. And so God wants us to do things out of our heart in the right motives, with the right attitude, and not with a rebellious attitude because of the fact, hey... He's going to judge us. I was reading a verse over in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than the burnt offerings. You see, you and I need to understand God and how he thinks. He doesn't think the way we think. His thoughts are not our thoughts, nor his ways our ways. We think sometimes that, hey, uh, we, uh, if we do it this way. No, what we need to do is go to the Bible and see way, the way God does things. And then, then do it from there. So uh, tonight, you and I need to understand that we do need to give things right back to God. We are to give sacrifices that lead. Are you listening? We need to give sacrifices that lead you and myself to the principle of obedience with the right attitude while the right motives in our life. So that's what Asaph was saying here. He found that out. All right. Look down to verse number uh, 9 there. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy foes. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are Say that next word with me. Mine. You see, you and I need to give to him because everything belongs to him in the first place. Isn't that right? And that's what he's saying here. He says, look, he says, don't give to God because you think he needs it. No, we give to God because he is going to use it for something, for our good, for his glory, and for the benefit of somebody else. See? 
And so Asaph brings out here, he says, we don't need to do this because of the fact that it belongs to God in the first place. What we have has only been lent to us to use for His purposes. And when I keep that in focus, that changes my outlook on everything that I do for God. You see, that's the reason that the ministry is a joy to me. is because I just leave it in the Lord's hands. I just leave it in His hands. I trust Him. I'm not going to try to work the thing out myself. I'm going to look to the Lord because my time's in His hands. My life is in His hands. Well, it's not my time in the first place. It's His time. And uh, everything that we have, every possession, it belongs to Him. Uh, John 1, 3 says this, All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, if that, uh, that being true, not if that being true, but since that is true, if He made everything... Everything belongs to him, right? Amen. I mean, uh, he spoke everything into existence. Now watch this. He not only spoke everything into existence, but he took the things that were in existence that he made. They spoke in existence, then he made things out of them. You ever understand that? That's the reason we have Genesis 1 and 2. Ex Lahil. He took things and formed them. First of all, he spoke everything into existence. Secondly, he took things and formed them. All right? So everything that is around us belongs to him. Hey, you sow that corn in God's ground, it belongs to him. By the way, he's the one that gave the corn. He's the one that gave the first seeds. See? When you begin to look at things from that perspective, you realize, hey, when you sow corn in the ground, then that's God's corn going in the ground. So guess what? God isn't going to let that corn go in the ground without letting it grow because it belongs to him. See? And you know what? When God lets corn go in the ground, guess what? You get a stalk, and then you get years on that stalk, and you get more corn back than you ever had before. <laughs> Isn't that good? I mean, God, you, you think about this. You take a little tomato, uh, and I, I, I've done this because i got some growing over there. Take one little seed out of a tomato, and you put that in, in, in that little uh, you know, pea pod, and pretty soon you got a little stalk coming up, and then you're going to put that thing in the ground, and then you're going to get some tomatoes on there. Think of how many little seeds you get in that tomato. Huh? God can only do that. So, God gave it to us. Give to him because it belongs to him. Colossians 1.16, listen to this. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, now watch this, and for him. That kind of wraps the package up, doesn't it, folks? See? And that's why we ought to give everything back to him because it belongs to him. That's the reason the Bible says bring the first fruits unto him. See? And like I said before, you just can't outgive God. Amen. You can't. Amen. I mean, when my wife and I got married, first thing we said, everything we have, we give back to God. Doesn't belong to us. Will it be money? Will it be our children? One of the first things we did after our children were born, we dedicated them to the Lord and gave them back to the Lord. Turned them over to the Lord. They're yours, Lord. If you want to whip the fire out of them, go ahead and do it. You know, because they belong to you in the first place. And so we need to do that. But uh, look, look there, uh, back at verse number uh, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Three times God says, look, the forest is mine. He uses the word mine. Uh, the beasts of the field are mine. Uh, the world is mine. That kind of zips it up, doesn't it, folks? I mean, that kind of concludes the matter. That everything belongs to God. So when you, when you, when you think about it, give to him because it belongs to him after all. There's a third thing. Look down at verse 14 and 15. Well, let's, let's, read, uh, let's read the... Uh, 
Verse 13 and 14 first. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. Give thanksgiving the things you told, that you told God you were going to give him in the first place. You know, I've always told the Lord, I'll give him whatever he wants me to give back to him. And the first thing that we do with our paychecks, and I'm not trying to dwell on money tonight. Uh, so many people think preachers just uh, dwell on money. That, that's not a thing. It's, it's an illustration. But the first amount comes right out of our check. Give the Lord. It seems like I give, and God just keeps giving back to me so much. God has blessed me so much. And over and over and over and over again. And, and I, I could have several of you probably stand up here tell, and you can tell me how God has blessed you and he's given to you over and over and over up through the years. And it seems like the more you give to God, the more he gives back to you. And uh, that's in everything, regardless of what it is, finances or so forth. And throughout the Bible, we're taught to continually give him something, and that is thanksgiving and praise. You see, his highest creation, which is mankind, God desires for us to give him thanks. God desires for us to give him praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, you can write that scripture down. It says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Have you ever really zeroed in on this in your life? Lord, thank you for the rain when it rains. Now, this is a hard one for me. Thank you, Lord, for the snow. <laughs> but you do. And when I begin to think about this, now, Lord, if we were out without snow, then uh, really we're mo uh, losing out on a very important thing, and that's nitrogen that puts, goes into the ground to help our crops. We need that. So... We need to give him thanks. We need to praise him. And that's the reason we find so much in the book of Psalms about the matter of praising God. We need to do that in our lives. Uh, look, if you would, down at verse number 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. To him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. But the first part is when you and I offer praise to him, we end up glorifying the Lord. And the Bible says, and whatsoever you do and what you eat, do what? Do it all to the glory of God. But wait a minute. Let's look at another thing here very quickly. Look down at verse 14 in the latter part of the verse. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thou, thy vows unto the Most High. I've got to be careful about that. Uh, my wife says, no, honey, make sure you pronounce vows right because you, you say it the Kentucky way, vows. You know, a valve in a car, you know. So, uh, but we're to fulfill the vows that we've made to him. Uh, While well, you have your Bibles there, just hold your place in the book of Psalms. Let's look at two verses. Let's go over to the book of Deuteronomy first. Deuteronomy chapter 23, if you would please. And look down at verse number 21. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and 21. All right, when you get there, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21 says, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it will be sin in thee. So we've got to be very careful when we uh, take and make a vow. Uh, turn over to the book of Ecclesiastics. Make a right turn and, as we're going back there and uh, skip over Psalms. And look at Ecclesiastics chapter number 5 and look down to verse number 4 if you would please. It's similar to the book of Deuteronomy but there's special wording in here too uh, that has to do with uh, uh, what the Lord calls us if we don't do it. Look, look at chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God defer not to pay it for he hath no pleasure in who? Fools. Now what is a fool? 
A, a fool is a person who knows what's right to do, but doesn't do it. See, he knows it's right. He, but he, he, he says, well, uh, the Lord knows my heart. Yeah, he knows it, and he says you ought to fulfill it. And then the latter part of that verse uh, of Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldst not vow than that thou shouldst vow and not pay. And then he goes in verse 6 and he says, Suffer not thy mouth. In other words, don't allow it. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou, thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? He's talking about this matter of making a vow unto the Lord, whatever it is. In uh, that word vow today, we would equate it with what we call a pledge. Yeah, Lord, I, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do it. And then we don't show up. Now, I realize there are times that we don't, we can't do it. And if we, like for example, uh, tell, you know, uh, you know, because maybe we got called into work or maybe we were sick or whatever, God understands that. Though we've made that vow, that's an exception to the rule, so to speak. Are you with me? All right, so uh, we need to do that. But wait a minute, there's a fifth thing, and I want you to look here very quickly, if you would. Go, go back to the book of Psalm, chapter 50. And if you would there, look down at verse number 15. He says, And call upon, the day, and call upon, me, in the, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Here's another thought. Give time in prayer. Now, I didn't put that in your sheet. I'd already printed it up when I went back through it again and, and studied it. But give time in prayer. For prayer in your life. Uh, we ought to have a set time every day. Or at least set a time. You may not be able to do it in the morning. But maybe you can do it in the evening. Now I like doing it in the morning. I like doing it in the evening both. And maybe some of you do the same thing. In the morning I have my devotions and prayer. Then in the evening I have devotions and prayer with my wife. Together. And, uh, of course, I pray out through the day. And I, uh, you know, you can pray anywhere. I mean, you can pray right along, just as long as you keep... keep. Now, they, might, they may put an ordinance against that, Brother Danny. They might, they might come out and say, no praying, just like there's no texting or, you know, talking on the phone. Well, you know, you, you might get so concentrating on the Lord, you might have a wreck. But uh, you got to be careful. But pray wherever you are. And we ought to constantly uh, pray about things. So we need to call upon the Lord. Look at verse 16. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? And that thou should take my covenant in thy mouth. Seeing thou hast instruction and castest my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou countest, uh, consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth the seat. The next thing is, give things from your mouth, the things of a pure nature rather than evil. Give your mouth to the Lord. Let the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart be acceptable unto the Lord, the Bible tells us. See, every word that comes out of our mouth. Uh, that helps us. Listen, if we concentrate on that a little bit, we'd be careful about what we say to pr uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We'd be careful about what we say to our kids. We'd be careful about what we say to other people, uh, you know, uh, uh, out on the road. Uh, you know, you might not say it out loud, but you're driving and you, you say, you're calling that person in front of you all kinds of names because you want to get out, you know, you want to get around. Be careful. See? Be careful about the words. Let the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be acceptable unto the Lord. And so those are things that we can give him. Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, there's two things there. He says, if it doesn't build up, don't say it. If it isn't going to help a person in their life, just, just keep it to yourself, see? And then he says, not only that, but it also expresses grace to somebody. I'll be careful. It's all right. Maybe they've done something against you. And uh, you say, that's right, I forgive you. What does the Bible say? 
you forgive somebody else, God says, he'll forgive you. I think that's Matthew 6.14. If I'm not let me check my card real quick. I've been memorizing this week. Yes. Why should I forgive others? Matthew 6.14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And God wants us to do that. See, that is giving back to God. When you forgive somebody else, you're actually giving back to God. See? And God wants us to do that in our lives. He wants us to give with our mouths. And, of course, he wants us to give things of a pure nature rather than an evil nature. In other words, saying something nasty to somebody or even using a wrong word as far as we would call it cursing. And we've got to be careful about that. There's another thing we can give back. Look down verse 20. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things have, hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one of thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. You see, we've got to be careful in regards to what we say, and we want to use our words in a right way. Now, look at verse number 22. Now consider this, ye that forget God. There's time element involved in that. There's a time element involved in that. Giving back the time principle. Wait a minute. How do we give back to God the time principle? In prayer? In reading our Bibles? In memorizing Scripture? In witnessing to people? In going to church? And we just list a bunch of them. Those are just a few that come to our mind very quickly. But you see, God wants us to do that. In helping others. Do you, do you think God will reward you for helping others? You're giving your time and helping somebody? Now I've got to get, I'm getting ahead of myself here tonight. Because I'm going to use it Sunday night too. So but you guys are going to get a plus, okay? Mona and I, after, I think it was either, it was either Monday night. I don't think it was after church on Sunday. We, we've walked every, uh, a couple nights this week. And then we've walked every morning. Uh, usually, uh, it's usually every morning. But the other night, uh, we were walking up the, on the left side there across from well, that nice, beautiful home there, uh, Eloise. It's almost near you guys uh, right there. Anyway, I, uh, Raphael is the, la the people's last name. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we were walking by there, and here is Mr. Raphael. He has, uh, uh, he has this big piece of uh, carpet on his shoulder like this. And here's his poor little wife. You, you know how uh, small she is. Here is his wife. Man, she's struggling with this carpet. So I saw him, and I jumped across their, their bushes. And I went up to the house. I said, hey, it looks like you need some help. And so I grabbed that thing and put it up on my shoulder. And then Mr. Raphael, we took it in and, and took it upstairs. Well, that poor lady, she would have probably never made it upstairs. We had a wonderful talk with that couple. Now, they go to the Methodist Church uptown. But what a delight. I had knocked on their doors before, but never been able to catch them home. And we had such a good talk that they invited us to come back. And, of course, we had the opportunity of making sure that they knew the Lord as our Savior. But it's helping others. When you see somebody like that, just jump in there and help them. You know, you don't, they think you're an idiot in the first place, but, you know, you go ahead and do it anyhow. And my wife says, there goes your back, honey. <laughs> That's all right, because, you know what? We had the opportunity of helping somebody else. Along that line. And I'll go a little bit more in detail on Sunday night when I talk about the subject I'm going to be preaching on. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, we need to give our time back. Our time does not belong to us, it belongs to God. Don't you believe that? See? And God wants us to do that. All right, let me finish this up real quickly. Go down to verse number 23, if you would please. Give him glory through our praise. Look at verse 23, and I read the first part of it a while ago. Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. You see, our conversation, everything that we do are, is to be to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He talks about, and whatsoever you do, and where do you do it? All to the glory of God. Praising Him, honoring Him. Uh, real quickly, because our time is just about up, would you turn over to the book of Revelation? 
Revelation chapter number 4. And look at verses 10 through 11. In the very last book of the Bible here, God shows us one of the most important things that you and I can do in our lives in regards to giving back to God, though it's spread throughout the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse number 10. It says, matter of fact, let's go back to verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Let's read it together. Verse number 11. Everyone together. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, God desires for us to give back to him. Now let me close with this. God owns everything. Would you concur with that thought and statement? Well, if God owns everything, what in the world can we give back to Him? We can give ourselves. Because He created us with a free will. And He want, doesn't want us to feel like we're made to do something. He wants us to give ourselves back to Him. Will it be in salvation? Or whether it be just an everyday life, God wants us to do that. My mind goes to the song. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and praise him in his presence daily yeah, live. You see, God wants us to do that. So the next time that you think you don't have anything to give back to God, you got a lot you can give back to God. You may not have anything in your pockets. You may not even have what the little lady there did that day when all the people walked by the treasury and they dropped in all their big gifts, but she only had a little mite to give God. And Jesus said, this lady gave more than you all. So the next time you don't have much to give God, you say, Lord, I don't have much to give, but I can give you my time that you've given me in the first place. Or I'll do this or that. You've given God back what you could give because he's given it to you. Let's bow our heads on a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your gifts that you've given to us abundantly. And you've given us this time to come here tonight that we can look into this chapter here of 50. And we're grateful, Lord, that we can come before you and give you our prayer requests and then you turn right around and and give back to us because there in verse 15, one of my favorite Bible verses, Lord, that you gave. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And so, Lord, may we take these things to heart, and may we let you have your will and your way in our lives, that we give back that which you've given to us in the first place. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would take your prayer.